Hey, right. good morning, everybody. Welcome. And we're uh, here this morning. Uh, welcome to the Chechi. I hope that's pronounced right. Big bite for uh, December. What's the date today? 13. Sure. We're going to be talking about our hybrid high flex technology, OWL technology that some of us have been using in the last semester or so. And uh, we want to welcome you to this big bite presentation. So, um, I know there's not many of you on the line. Hopefully some of you get a chance to view this uh, and I will also be sharing with you the location that all of these recordings from this year and years past for the Big Bites will be housed on the Chechi website. So with that, I'm gonna get us kicked off here. I wanna thank Greg uh, Warson, Dr. Greg Warson for um, being part of this presentation today. We actually, Greg and I are gonna be talking a little bit about our use of OWL technology, but um, in the bigger picture, it's related back to the idea that in the pandemic, we were being asked to do some things that we hadn't maybe done before, which was maybe, um, maybe you had students streaming in from a virtual location whilst other students were in the class. Maybe you were teaching online synchronous or asynchronous classes for the first time. Regardless of what you were asked to do, we're now in the kind of getting into the place and space, although <laughs> things are upticking again. But we're hopefully getting into the place and space where we have a chance to reflect on that. And for today's presentation, I, I asked Greg to um, um, talk a little bit about his use of the OWL technology in his teaching. And so, Greg, uh, why don't you kick it off and then I'll jump in with some some little tidbits here and there, because I know sure. we're, we're technically supposed to be co-presenting, but I think your story is a little more compelling than mine. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, probably because it's filled with <laughs> adversity and, and depending on uh, helpful guides to get me through. Uh, for, for us in the Ed Specialist Program in particular, um, when we ran into the pandemic, of course, like many programs, we, we initially went to all virtual. Um, and then part of, um, as part of that, that process, eventually evolved into a decision where we wanted to tell folks that they could, they could zoom into the program um, <clears throat> kind of as needed. Now, historically, we had not done that. Um, but the pandemic, I think, kind of nudged us into that. And so then the question became, well, how can we create the best experience for folks if they are going to zoom in? And what does that look like? Um, the other uh, unintended yet positive consequence to that is that it really stabilized and or helped our enrollment. Uh, we had been trying to build cohorts out of Detroit um, and I know the program has had cohorts in Detroit, but we had been trying to build another one and we were just two, three, four students shy of that. Well, once you bring in the option that people can kind of zoom into the courses, uh, then it sort of eliminates the barrier of, of geography, so to speak. And so that kind of uh, really helped that out. And it, and it really kind of forced us to take a look at the question of, okay, are, are we serving students or, or clients or, or both? Um, and <clears throat> the more conversations that we had, the more it kind of evolved as, you know, we might be doing, in, in essence, kind of doing both. Um, forgive the uh, water delivery here in the background, but anyway, that's in there and there. Um, so, uh, and as we look at, at this academic year and beyond, the question kind of becomes, okay, what are those expectations? Uh, in terms of of, how, of course delivery and what you know what is that going to look like going forward, um, and how do we how do we approach you know the the portion of the learning that students do independently on their own versus when they're either present virtually or in person, and for us in the Ed leadership program we really kind of focus on okay if, if folks are going to physically show up or if they're going to log in we should be providing them with some sort of an experience that made it worth their time to do so. Otherwise, we could just send them a video or send them stuff to read and they can do that on their own. They don't necessarily need us. Um, so that kind of brings us to the place of this OWL technology and you know, what is the OWL and how is it, how is it, how and or why is it used? And Rick, I think that's, that's where you kind of dive in. Well, I, I don't think there's anything really compelling that I have to say with the exception of uh, the idea that the OWL is really only a piece of technology. It's a tool that we now have access to 
Um, I'm not sure that we have access to after this uh, presentation or for anybody who watches it, I'm not sure we have access to all kinds of them. I think there's two or three that have been available to faculty through um, through the Office of Innovation, I believe. But um, but I think more importantly for for this presentation and, and what Greg's been talking about, um, it it remains a tool, but Greg still remains the, the driver in terms of the kinds of experiences that students have in the classroom, whether they're participating virtually or whether they're participating um, in the face-to-face -face portion. And I think the, the complexity um, prior to uh, us teaching in that format, and um, when I say us, I mean, Greg and I, we've, we've talked a lot about this topic, you know, we would have, we, during the pandemic in the in the 2020 we had students participating in class um, virtually and face to face and it was very difficult because traditional webcams you know you're trying to move them around or you're setting up an additional computer in the classroom so students online can actually see what's going on in the classroom and uh, that was pretty frustrating simply because I was, I found myself, and I think Greg would say the same thing, managing the technology more than um, my instruction. And in and, and, and truth be told, I mean, I was actually feeling like my instruction was suffering quite a bit because I was always focusing on trying to manage the technology and keeping everybody, you know, in place and on what we were doing, etc. So again, this I, I believe that this this piece of technology eases that complexity for for um, um, you know for the instruction side and puts us hopefully more back on an, on a um, emphasis on the instruction where I felt when I was using it in my classroom I was able to um, focus on the instruction again and let the owl do the work in terms of um, the the managing the technology. Um, the, the, you'll see um, once Greg starts it up, the increased um, audio uh, pickup, like you probably heard that big old bang in the background. <laughs> that was from something, that, something that's going on back there. I'm not sure. Um, so the audio becomes less of a problem and the, um, the, there is a, a, view, a 360 view of the classroom. So what Greg and I thought we would do is we'd go right into a demonstration. So Greg's going to kind of man that and um, and show you what it's it's a plug and play uh, piece of technology. So he's going to show us how that works. So Greg, I'll let you take it from here then. Okay. And by way of truth and advertising, um, I am in the sort of the conference area between uh, Rick's office and my office. Um, so I'm kind of just kind of in this kind of alcove uh, area. And then I promise you, the only thing I've done before this, uh, we did a couple dry runs, but uh, before that, all I really did was plug in the power to the, uh, the, the owl. And the reason I'm trying to, uh, the reason I'm pointing it out is to demonstrate, it's fairly straightforward to kind of plug it in. Once I've plugged the owl in, it will take over the audio and the video of my Zoom room. And Rick, I'm assuming you've made me host right now or co-host or whatever. Yep. And then... <clears throat> Uh, once, once I've successfully, fingers crossed, uh, once I've successfully connected all this stuff, uh, then Rick Vannermolen will come out of his office and he'll come into this, uh, uh, this conference area and hopefully the owl will pick us both up and you'll be able to kind of see and or hear the difference between the two. So here, here is the physical, the physical owl itself. It's just sitting on this uh, table in the middle. And you can see two wires coming from it. One of the wires is uh, for audio and one of the, or I'm sorry, one of the wires is for AC power. And the other wire is this little USB thing that's pretty straightforward. You just kind of plug it into the side. So when I do that, it should start to take over. Now, if it doesn't uh, fully take over, I can go into my my microphone at the bottom left and or my uh, camera at the bottom left of my screen and double check to make sure that the owl is, is picking that up. And I, and I may have to do that, but that's, that's about the only tech thing that you have to do. So, okay. oh, and the one final thing, I put the Zoom address in the chat, but you probably all have the Zoom address because you all got here. So if, if for some reason we get disconnected, you'll be able to kind of get back. So here we go. Bye -bye.
Okay, so you should be able to see at this point then, let me double check. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? Yep. Okay, and now Rick has joined us. And Rick, you wanna say something? Can you hear me? Can you hear Rick? And you can probably see Rick in that little band at the top of the screen, okay? And the difference is that um, the owl picking up his voice and or allowing you to see him is much better than if you just have a laptop sitting, like, you know, sitting in the space of where a, a teacher or where a student would be. Right, so now if I'm in your classroom, I don't have to be on Zoom in order to see the other students because Greg can project this up on the screen. The owl is picking up the audio. And um, if I'm moving around in the room, you can see me moving around because it's got a 360 degree camera. Yeah. So Rick's over there. In fact, he could even go over there and say hello to Vita, who um, we always love seeing. We can showcase Vita. We Here can showcase is. Vita. There she is. <laughs> Yeah, and you're, you're, you're getting nothing but applause over here, Vita. Right, Everybody <laughs> loves you, Vita. I love it. Um, <laughs> one, one reason I'm kind of a fan of this technology is I actually experienced it on the user end um, this past summer. Um, I'm working on a grant through Battle Creek, and we were doing some of our meetings virtually, and they brought this in, and instead of uh, setting up a laptop, they have everybody kind of present from, and it was a game changer. I mean, the, the audio component is, is far better. You can just hear it much better. And if people moved around the room, <laughs> you could still see them and hear them. Um, so from a teaching standpoint, you could literally kind of teach from just about anywhere. Um, now, there might still be some things that you want to project um, through your Zoom. Uh, and you can still share your screen. And so for folks like the three of you that are not physically present in the room, um, I can share a screen, for example, and you're still going to see see kind of what I share. So hopefully at this point you can see an outline of today's big bite. And then Greg, on the on the user end or the, the virtual end side of things, obviously you can adjust your view. You will always have that that band across the top that's giving you the 360 degree view of the room, but you also should be able to change your view of the people who are participating online. So even when you share that screen, you can do the gallery view, you can do the, the sidebar view, whatever your preference is. Yeah. Um, before we go any further, and just to kind of get a sense of, of the degree to which it's, it's working, um, I'd like at this point to kind of go around and do a brief introduction because I think uh, four of us know each other, but uh, Deborah, uh, you're new. So it might be a, a good for the rest of us to kind of get a sense of who you are. But before we put you on the spot, I'll put my, my fearless mentor, uh, Dr. Rick Geisel on the spot. So Rick, who are you? Good morning. Uh, my name is Rick Geisel. I teach with Rick and Greg in the Educational Leadership Program. And uh, it's nice to have you here, Deborah. Judy. Hi, Deborah. My name is Judy Williams, and I am in the same unit as the gentlemen that are with us today. And I am a professor in the MED and school counseling program. She said, "Gentlemen," and I just you know flinched <laughs> and looked around. <laughs> uh, the other two guys. So, uh, Vita, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Vita Hodges, and I'm the office coordinator for the Center for Educational Partnerships. All right. Nice to see your people. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the warm introduction. Um, my name is Debbie Ronk. I am in the School of Social Work. I'm the MSW Field Education Coordinator, but I also teach some um, Bachelor of Social Work seminar courses. And in this upcoming semester, um, I've had just increased absences due to either COVID or exposures. I have a student who's having surgery, and so they have been requesting, you know, to be able to zoom in 
kind of as you're talking about, and I was just looking for, you know, are there options to make, help that still be a, a good experience for the students that are present in person and those that are maybe zooming in. So thank you. Sure, sure. Great to have you. And I'm Greg Worson. I teach in the leadership program with uh, with the two Ricks, and I'm right down the hall from from Judy. Um, so she, you know, I, I can always walk down that hall, part of the hallway, and it's it's very therapeutic. You know, the school counseling prep area. That everybody's in touch with their feelings, and uh, that's really helpful for me because I don't always know what a feeling is. Um, we had some practical considerations that we wanted to kind of chat about uh, in terms of the owl, but uh, before we dive into that, are there any other specific questions that folks have? I did have one question. So it does the OWL work both ways? So if you have students that are participating remotely, is it also um, projecting sound for, from those folks or is it only to enhance the them being able to hear what's going on in the classroom? I'd say yes to both. In other words, we're talking, Deborah, uh, Vita, who is probably, I would say, what, 10 feet away? 15 feet away. 15 10 feet away. Yeah. Vita can hear you as if you're here in the room, like you're, like you're projecting your voice. Mm -hmm. In time, when Vita spoke, she didn't leave her desk. She just spoke to introduce herself. And we, we could all hear that. I'm assuming the three of you, the four of you could all hear that as well. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I'd say both are true. It does bring up a practical consideration of where do you put the owl? Um, and in the, the few times that I've used it, I try to position it as centrally as possible. Um, you know, so if you're, I don't know if you guys, uh, Deborah, do you teach in those case rooms at all? Uh, not this year. I've been in them in the past, but um, this year I'm just in a regular classroom and we actually kind of move things around to build a, like a large square so that Okay. We can facilitate conversation. For sure. And and part of where uh, what I had done uh, when I used it uh, this past semester is I sort of positioned myself um, behind the owl. The owl was between me and the screen, and then the students were kind of around me on, on both sides, so that the owl was sort of in the middle capturing sound and, and uh, video. Um, but then if I needed to project something up on the screen, we were all kind of looking at that as we're at the same time. So remember, whatever you screen share, um, <clears throat> the folks that are coming in remotely are seeing, obviously. And then if you, if you connect your laptop with that HDMI cord, uh, with an HDMI cord to the, um, to the teaching station, then that's going to get whatever's on your screen up on the main screen. You follow? So that, that's kind of how you're able to kind of, kind of run both. Um, that, I mean, there are there are a few questions to kind of think through uh, before before using it, but it's one of those deals where I think, at least from my perspective, and we'll find out more next semester uh, when I try to use it again. Um, I think once you you leap the hurdle once, uh, you, you've kind of figured out. Okay, here's how here's how this works. Um, can I that, just can I just yeah. jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. um, so, Deborah, I think. I would go back to again what I what we talked about earlier, um, or for anybody who's listening to this um, recorded uh, session. You know why is it used? And I, you brought up some good points about why would we use this? And right now, given the conditions that we're working under, um, you brought up the idea that some students are having medical issues. Absolutely, this is one of the reasons why we would want this technology available to us. Um, uh, and the other one is distance. So we've tried to we've, we, we've tried to um, honor the courses the way they've been listed. So if it's listed as hybrid, we continue to meet in person. But in the situation where a student has a medical condition or they simply cannot physically be on campus because of a distance, but yet they need the course in order to finish their degree program, this is where we have used the OWL technology. I'll give you a good example. This past summer, I had a student who was in the Ed Specialist program and she was lit temporarily living in Dubai, but she needed to take the class when I was teaching it over the spring summer semester. 
As a result, I was able to use the OWL technology to have her participate. Now she could have participated in just using Zoom, but of course I wanted to use the OWL because it was it's enhancing a couple different things. It's enhancing the video, it's enhancing the audio and, and allowing me to do less managing of the technology and more focused on my instruction. But again, going back to, and I don't wanna beat a dead horse here, but it doesn't matter whether you have the owl or not, we still need to pedagogically think about what is it that we want to do with our students in the classroom um, and using that flipped classroom approach where we're, we're applying concepts and trying to build in higher order thinking in our time with the students versus what they could be doing independently in the online modules that we're asking them to do. Rick Geisel, did you have a question? Yeah, first of all, though, um, now that I know that Vita can hear us, I'm selfishly going to give a shout out to Vita and say, hey, this is Rick Geisel, and I miss you, and happy holidays to you. Thanks, Rick. Same to you. Uh, but that is, honestly, that is a that is cool feature because I you can see that Vita is quite a bit in the background. So that does give me some depth perception as to the possibilities um, with the technology, and I appreciate that. I do have two questions. One is, so if you were teaching a hybrid course and you had the OWL with you and you only had one student who was joining you via Zoom and using this OWL technology, if you're breaking out into small group work, let's say case studies or whatever, how would you logistically go about um, in, integrating that one student online effectively? I, I'm, I guess I've been having a little bit of difficulty trying to figure out how to do that well. You wanna take that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what I'd recommend, and, and we just uh, experienced this uh, literally an hour ago when we were doing a dry run, um, for, the, for the person that's Zooming in, for the, the group that has that person, um, I'd recommend that they then log into the Zoom room for the, the space of the small, the small group time. Um, so that they can all connect. If they're in the same, if they're going to stay in the same classroom, earbuds are going to prevent the reverberation between the two. But I think the best solution is to send that group, um, to send that group with the out, out, of, out of the room and just have them together on the Zoom. And then when they come back, then you don't have to send the owl with them. They can just kind of, kind of do the Zoom thing in another space. Because they're in a breakout room. They're in a breakout room. Okay. And then when they come back, then they can reconnect to the owl and they can turn the. And then I would say when they, the students physically come back in the room, they can get out of the Zoom room because they don't need to be in the Zoom room anyway. And then that would prevent reverberation. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I did this summer in my uh, EDL 668 class. We had three people participating and, and I, I could have done the easy thing and just had the three people go into a breakout room and then the than physically, but there were some people who were doing a similar presentation and they wanted to collaborate around the topic. So as a result of that, we, we created breakout rooms. Some of them left the room, one group left the room, which allowed them to not have to use earbuds as Greg mentioned, but the other group stayed in the room. So they plugged in, they could hear the chat between them um, through the earbuds, and then um, they were able to collaborate around the topic. So. It's a little bit, you have to think it through, but I, I think Greg's totally um, got, you know, he's got the formula there in terms of how you, could you make it work, especially like Greg, when you mentioned, you know, what if it's only one, or sorry, um, Rick, when you mentioned, what if it's only one student of a class, you know, how can you get them to participate? And that's, that would be one strategy that we found has worked um, in the last several semesters. You know, Thank you, that's really helpful because I, I wouldn't have even thought about the reverb and, and the idea of maybe even prepping people to bring some earbuds, which brings up another question for me. I have tried to join a Zoom before with my AirPods and get dropped from the volume. Have you, have you had that issue where people are unable to hear through their earbuds um, while using Zoom? Is yeah, Rick, I, I, I would... I don't mean, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I, I would say the, it's a really, really good point And it's a really good question. That's kind of technical. And I've only, I've only experienced it 
because I had to go through trial and error. And that is to say, if people have actual hardwire where you are actually connecting to the, the jack in your computer, that's a better case scenario than using the earbuds that are Bluetooth because the Bluetooth technology does um, get dropped sometimes and the hardwire earbuds, um, it doesn't get dropped. So it's, you know, I hate to be, um, I mean, you want to stay up with the technology, but here's an example of, of a, a lower technology actually working better than, than the up, most update technology. Interesting. Thank you. I really appreciate that tip, Rick, because these are the little things that can either frust totally frustrate um, an attempt to use the technology or help it go rather smoothly. So I appreciate the, the audio tips. I guess the last question right now is um, you mentioned there are just a couple on campus. I know you've had access because you're out there piloting these things and, and um, a, a front runner with these technologies. Um, do you see challenges in the future in terms of, of being able to access the technology for those of us who teach all over the place, or is there a plan in place to get more, get more um, of these available? I, you know, it's make, that's a great question. It makes me <laughs> laugh because uh, I'm going to specifically send this um this uh, video recording to Eric Kunin and, and say, uh, <laughs> dude, you better find some money in your budget because once this gets out there, people are going to want access to it. Um, but again, you know, I guess, Rick, um, philosophically, your point is really well taken. If we're going to be asked to teach in these situations and, and as instructors, if we're always trying to find best ways to integrate technology to improve our our students' experiences in the classroom, then we need to have these tools available to us um, so that we're not, you know, scrambling to, you know, and quite honestly, Greg and I have, have been, it's been great because we've just shared it going back and forth, but it's not really feasible for instructors to be calling each other and saying, hey, I got a class next week, Thursday night from six to nine. Do you still have the owl? Can, can you make sure that we find a time where we can transfer and stuff like that? So, um, I, at this point, I don't think we have enough owls, uh, and there are other versions of this made by other companies. I think another one's called a neat bar. Um, but I'm not sure if Eric has enough for everybody to, uh, have access to them. But again, he is, he's doing the trial and error piece because we're trying to figure out what can help instructors, um, primarily with this situation, you know, where we've got students streaming in because of the medical or the distance related issues. Yeah, Deborah, you asked a question in the chat around around access. Um, and, you know, I think, I think Rick kind of answered that the other person I'd throw out there would be Hunter Bidwell. I know yep. he was the guy that emailed me for the winter semester and said, hey, are you still using that thing? If not, can I get it back? Because there could be some other people that want to use it. So he might be someone who, who needs to use it now. What I, what I shared with, with him, and I would certainly share with you, uh, Deborah, as well, is that I'm only using it uh, four nights uh, throughout the entire term. So um, outside of that, I, you know, it'll be either in my home office or my office office. And if we wanted to coordinate with Hunter or whomever to say, you know, if you wanted to, to use it, by all means, we could try to make that work. So, Judy? Yeah, my question was the same along the same lines as Debbie, because sometimes we have students that email us or text us at the last minute before class, can't make it, just got my COVID test results, whatever it is. And just wondering, you know, that kind of spur of the moment use, or if we should just use kind of the typical Zoom and adapt it from there. Yeah, I, I can't really speak to last minute. I don't know what the access there who that I, I would, would it be? Yeah. Good Hunter, Hunter oh. work. I understand from, from Eric is that Hunter has now um, transferred into Eric's department and they're working specifically on using innovative technology and teaching and trying to support um, GVSU uh, instructors with that. Okay. Um, again, I think Judy, one of the reasons that we felt this topic should be talked about or even just share our Greg and my story about it is simply because mm -hmm. Um, if you've used the OWL technology, and I think Greg would say the same, and certainly Greg, you share your opinion, but 
I, I won't go back to doing what you just suggested, which is zooming and, um, you know, just doing it the same old way where I'm managing the, the virtual and the face-to-face -face students with all the, you know, the webcam. It's like, why I'm not going backwards on this. I know that the owl can do this so much better. If I have to do that, I'm going to have access to the owl because it, it takes so much less of my instructional time to manage the technology that I would encourage you to try to find a way to make this happen for, you know, to make it part of your teaching in the next semester, because it's, it's going to, you're going to see the difference immediately when you are no longer having to manage these, um, the audio and the video because the owl does it for you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like for me, if someone said, do you want to go back to a flip phone compared to your, your iPhi? Yeah, you you're go. like, mm, no, I, I think I, I think I like all those apps. And I think I like having that computer in my pocket. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's a game changer. And so I, you know, yeah, I think my encouragement would be the same. Now, if I, if I ran stuck and I had one person who had to zoom in, might I manage that with my laptop if I absolutely had to? It's better yeah. than nothing. I think I suppose it's better than, than completely missing all the content. Um, but yeah, that that I would I would agree. So, Dr. Eisel, all right, go so, ahead, Judy. So, so when you're that. carrying that, uh, when you I'm sorry, Judy, oh. did you have a follow up? No, I I do, but I'll wait. You may ask it. So go ahead. Okay. Um, so when you're carrying that owl around with you, how much money are we talking about? <laughs> uh, the Owl Pro, which is the version that we have right here, is about a thousand dollars. <laughs> about a thousand that's it that's that's yeah it's not that I oh, mean, then this should this should easily be one in every unit at least so that there's access I and mean, if we're being encouraged to teach in these modalities and we're being encouraged to be more flexible there's got to be money like for right now for ease of access we should be that's advocating it. for that and um I, I think we have a unit meeting on Wednesday and I'm more than happy to bring that up um, as, as a, a point of priority. It, it just makes sense to me. I, I thought you were gonna tell me they were way more expensive than that. This should not be a barrier to access then. Oh, when this first came up, Rick, um, when, I, when I was made aware that, that Eric had one of these, I immediately asked him, um, well, in fact, he, in fact, I found out because I participated in a meeting and we were using the OWL technology. And I, I said to Justin and can I get one of these to use in my classroom? And um, when Eric and I priced them out, there is a cheaper one, but Eric and I both agreed that the OWL Pro, the thousand dollar version was definitely what we would need for teaching. So um, it's, it, like Greg said, it's a game changer, and I would, I, I'm going to be um, bringing that up at our unit meeting in terms of this topic, but certainly if you want to strategically post your, your comments related to what we talked about, that would be helpful. And I, I in, in some of the units in our college are fairly big, and I'm going to, I would follow up on your comment and say, maybe more than one probably two or three per unit so that I mean yeah I, I can point to at least half a dozen if not more at special students that are taking the program now that would not be taking the program um, if we didn't allow the dual mode um, I mean so you know each ed specialist student is about 22 to 23 grand I mean we can do the math pretty fast and you can justify very very quickly uh, to have have one accessible Oh, good question. Well, and Greg, just to add to your comment, you know, the other thing that's happening each semester, um, Deborah, I'm not sure if you're a GPD or not, but for Greg and I, we are always monitoring the enrollment for the next semester. And one of the things that happens is that you have to collapse sections. When you're collapsing sections, students are then having to look for courses that they um, they weren't necessarily um, planning to take or in versions, delivery versions that they weren't necessarily planning on. And so to alleviate that and ensure that they are still taking classes, offering the hybrid high flex or the dual modality model allows them to still take a class versus not having a class to take. So that's another, op another thing to keep in mind is 
and, and I'm speaking to the master's level um, courses that we teach in the leadership. So the, the other practical consideration that I forgot to even put in the notes is uh, having an extension cord is very, very helpful uh, just in terms of, because you want to be able to place that out wherever you want. Now I know in a case room, there are, there are electrical outlets just about everywhere, but in other, in other classrooms, that might not be the case. Um, so having an extension cord, and I, I like to have a power strip as well, just that way I, I've got multiple, um, you know, outlets to, for my own computer or, or whatever. So that's just one of the things. Yeah, Rick? Do you now put anything in your syllabi regarding the courses being recorded, or do you cover that at your first class meeting, uh, just to let people know that they're going to potentially be on camera and recorded? You know, that, that's a good question. I haven't. I think the closest thing I've done to something like that is um, I have uh, done like pre-course surveys, like in that first, the first couple of days of the semester, or even before the semester starts, I'll send out a Google form. And then one of the questions will be, okay, this is a dual mode course to help me plan. Can you tell me if you're going to be in the room or not? And I'll explain again what dual mode is. Uh, which you know, which means that you know it's going to be offered via Zoom and in, and in person. Usually, if it gets recorded, it's getting recorded for a reason. Like there was uh, someone who's had a schedule conflict or a work thing or a family thing, and they couldn't make it or whatever, and they're asking for that recording. And in those in those situations, I'll just kind of ask everybody in the room at the time, "Is everybody okay with this? Is anyone?" Ever have a problem no one's ever said they have a problem with it. so then i just kind of go so i don't get like signed you know signed releases or anything but yeah so. but but uh i rick, rick i've had a little bit of a different experience um i have actually had students who said yeah i mean you can record it but i'm i'm not going to feel as comfortable talking the way that i would have if it's not recorded so i have actually not recorded my sessions simply in some of the some of the courses I have, but others I haven't just based on like what Greg was saying, you know, the, you know, taking a, uh, a temperature of the room and getting a feel for what students are feeling about being recorded. Um, I have not put it in my syllabi either because I haven't experienced that I've had it enough notice in order to change my syllabi before the class starts. Um, so, but I, like Greg said, I've also talked about it with them about being on camera and, you know, creating those norms around if it is a dual mode class where the students are participating virtually, creating those norms around, um, you know, keeping your camera on and um, making sure that just because you're participating online that you're, that you're also considered part of the class and you should be participating just like a person in the room. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that there's a little bit of a challenge, you know, in the classroom, but I think it's a little bit more, especially online, where you can be a little more passive unless you are, you know, really um, making a mental note to stay engaged in the class. Um, yeah, with, and, it, and that's a great point. And I, I would say the OWL for me, you know, we had meetings in the summer using a laptop. And then we had meetings using Zoom or using the OWL. And my engagement in those meetings went up at least 30 or 40% because I could just hear everybody. And it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't difficult to hear folks that were 15, 20 feet away. Whereas before, unless they were standing right next to the laptop that was on, you couldn't hear them. <clears throat> and if they were presenting something to the group, they had to stand next to that laptop. And even then, you know, they're wearing a face mask and all that. It's, it's very hard to follow somebody that way. Um, and as far as the recording stuff too, I just tell students that the biggest impact it's going to have is going to be on my behavior because then suddenly I'm going to have to be much more appropriate. And, <laughs> you know, for those of you that know me, that that's a struggle for me to stay appropriate. So, so the recording kind of helps me, you um, know, with that collegiality piece. So, Judy, did you have a question? Yeah. So here's I'm thinking like next fall because my winter course really isn't going to fit into this because of the the learning labs that we do, but. What we're experiencing in our program is our online, so all of our courses are offered both face-to-face -face and online. Our online courses end up full 
And I know everyone teaching on this coming semester is at an overload already. And we're just nice people and accept that. So would it be in the future a possibility that once that online course fills, that those, if we're not at our max in the face-to-face, -face, those students could register for the face-to-face -face version of the course and then come in through the OWL? Am I understanding this correctly? Well, that is a really good question. I, I, I don't know what the answer is necessarily. I'm not sure if that's where that, where would that decision get made? Well, I mean, if you're, yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things you gotta, you've gotta keep in mind, Judy, is like you said already, your online classes are capped at 20. So if you already had 20 in your online and you, you um, wanted to allow for the dual modality piece in the face-to-face -face classes, then you would want access to the OWL technology. But remember the platform that the students are participating through is always through Zoom. The OWL is just enhancing the Zoom experience once they're in the classroom, whether they're participating virtually or, or, um, or in the actual classroom. So the OWL is just, it's a secondary piece of technology that, that brings the Zoom into a better place and space for all the students that are in the classroom. But certainly that's, that's an option and that's exactly what, you know, is happening for me next semester with one of my classes is that um, the, it was a hybrid. We had face-to-face -face and online, but as a result of closing some sections, one of them being an online section with five mm -hmm. students, um, I had to move, I have to move towards a dual modality delivery so that those online students who were in the other section now still can be in the, the class that I'm teaching. And so we're changing the delivery model for that class. So basically it becomes a synchronous online course for those distance learners. Basically, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great questions. Other questions? Okay, Dr. V, anything in uh, summary? Uh, final comments? No. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, we're being recorded too. I should have said something better than that. But um, no, I just think it's it's not. I don't think that it is the perfect scenario. I don't think that the owl technology is the best case scenario. I think the best case scenario is that you know our students can choose a a delivery platform, online synchronous, online asynchronous, hybrid face-to-face, -face, they can choose that. And in a perfect world, we could run all those sections and we'd have enough students to fill all those courses. But, and COVID wouldn't be in play in terms of the medical things that are happening. Um, the distance wouldn't be an issue, but what the OWL technology does offer us is when we're in those situations, we now have something that takes away the distraction from the instructor to focus more on the instruction with the students, whether they're participating virtually or face-to-face. -face. And for me, in my experience in there, and I think Greg would say the same, that's a big improvement for me um, because it was really distracting to have the, using Zoom and participating virtually and face-to-face -face with, you know, the old webcam technology with the terrible audio from your com the computer that was the laptop that's sitting at the front of the room. Yeah. Yeah, the tipping point for me for this really was um, uh, getting involved with the OWL from the user perspective. So yeah. Judy, Rick, and Deborah. So from your perspective, that was the game changer when I realized, oh my goodness, that meeting is so much easier for me to follow. And wouldn't the class be easier to follow <clears throat> if I had the OWL in the room? Um, and so that for me was why. Um, after I had that experience, it's like, yeah, I, I've got to figure out how to make this work um, because I had done stuff that we've all done to try to accommodate, you know, that one or two students that are that are coming in. Um, so that's uh, that's why it was important to me. And I'm sure that this is an initial technology; something better will come along. And I know Rick is Rick Vanderbilt is teaching in. I think it's 121E. That's all decked out with bells and whistles and all that good stuff, but. As far as being able to take this just into a classroom and being able to, I mean, plug and play and just plug it in and use it, it's kind of, it's a pretty good gig, so. 
Well, thanks for uh, coming out to this rather small group uh, experience. Um, appreciate everybody's questions and uh, it, you certainly posed a lot of good ones and we'll, uh, we'll take this recording, I'm sure. Rick will send it to uh, whomever. Um, so I'm sure it will be raining owls uh, in no time. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And we'll we'll get this recording out and get it adjusted just by um, just so you know, if you want to stick around for the meeting um, afterwards, we're going to we're going to um, get something going around 1105 or 1110. Um, we have a short agenda, so you're welcome to stick around for that. But um, we appreciate your time. And uh, for all those you are watching this online afterwards or, or virtually afterwards, whatever the case may be, we hope this is beneficial and uh, Certainly, Greg and I are also available to talk further about any details. If you're interested in using this technology in your teaching, uh, we would be happy to come alongside and support you with that. <laughs>